<clears throat> okay, so thanks very much for, for the invitation uh, and the opportunity to speak on the, the sector council I'm going to draw maybe from uh, some of the other uh, publications done, done by the CSO to try and maybe um, see what the additional data can tell us uh, about some of the key aggregates we have. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to focus on the current account of the balance of payments uh, because it is a, a hugely important indicator uh, and try to look and see what additional insights can we get uh, from the, the sector accounts and, and what has been added by what we've got uh, in the last couple of months and are the most recent figures we have, particularly for the modified current account, uh, are they reflective of what is happening uh, at a sectoral level uh, in the Irish economy? <laughs> so we're going to start with the, the bottom line. So Peter's gone through the, the different elements of the, the, the non-financial account and, and the bottom line there uh, is net lending borrowing. Uh, once you go through all the activities of the different sectors, uh, when you get to the end, do they have a, a surplus of financial assets for investment to pass through to the, the financial accounts that Chris has gone through, or do they have uh, a need to borrow uh, to meet some of the, the outgoings they've had uh, through the various stages of the accounts? So if you look at uh, the, the net lending, uh, from an Irish perspective, uh, our figure is reasonably plausible up to around 2010. So if you're looking at the Irish economy in the 21st century, uh, net lending would tell you a, a good story for the first 10 years, uh, relative balance up to 2003, 2004, and then the green line dives down uh, as we run into uh, the period of uh, borrowing where we, our activity exceeded the income we were generating. And then the, the crash comes in 2008, 2009, that borrowing stops and you go back up in an upward trajectory and you get sort of a plausible pattern up to 2010. And after that, then it's all over the place. <laughs> Not really seen any coherent or logical pattern uh, happening with what's happening with uh, net lending. And if you link that then to the, the balance of payments, like what is uh, net lending, net borrowing, uh, in the balance of payments, the equivalent would be the sum of the current account plus the capital account. So if you take the balance of payments, current and capital account, you'd end up with uh, net lending, net borrowing for different countries there. So you see towards the top, you have the Dutch, uh, the Germans and the Denmark, but maybe in the, in the case of the Netherlands, they should possibly be doing some of the work that's happening in Ireland. Uh, given the, the presence of multinationals there. Uh, and countries down towards the bottom, particularly towards the period of 2005, 6, and 7, we were in the category of uh, Portugal, uh, Spain, Greece, uh, and Ireland was in the mix there. But for the last 10 years, uh, our net lending, net borrowing, uh, doesn't really tell a plausible story. <coughs> when it comes to the balance of payments, the capital account tends to get ignored. Like how often do you hear a reference to the capital account and the balance of payments? And that's by and large because usually it's net zero or in or around net zero. Like as Peter's gone through, it's capital transfers uh, across borders, uh, and also trade in, in non-produced, um, non-financial assets. Uh, and of course, the, the largest of those would be land, which for reasons of definition, isn't traded across borders. Uh, but you can see that the Irish figure for the capital account uh, in recent years is going a bit crazy. So Irish macro statistics are out of whack. Version 356 is our, our capital account. Uh, and what's been happening here, of course, has been some firms have been buying non-produced, non-financial assets, things maybe like customer lists uh, or licenses, which are derived from uh, produced assets, derived from IP, uh, but aren't ne necessarily produced directly. Uh, and they are throwing up a huge deficit in recent years, uh, whereas in the main, the capital account for most countries is close to zero. So you do tend to get a focus uh, on the current account, and you say, well, maybe we'll get something better from the current account. And of course, for the last number of years, our headline current account has been even worse, uh, going from large, relatively large deficits to, to huge surpluses, uh, again now based uh, largely on uh, transactions undertaken by, by foreign multinationals. This is the purchase of the produced um, uh, non-financial assets, so the, the patents, the actual, the IP itself, uh, and other large transactions. So again, we have a coherent story up to 2010, but really we're not getting a whole lot out of it. So following the, the ESRG, and given the importance of the current account, uh, the CSO have been publishing a modified current account where some of these distortions uh, are stripped out. <laughs> and our story can now extend beyond 2010. Now, it does take a bit of, sort of splicing of, of different series. There's been different versions uh, of the modified current account. We're probably up to version 3.0 uh, at this stage, and maybe internally there's been even more. Uh, but if we put together a couple... Uh, and maybe some of it is somewhat inappropriate because there's different uh, methodology and different data. But in rough terms, we get to see a, a general trend. So the green one that appears every so often is the headline. I stopped that in 2010 because 
It doesn't really tell a coherent story after that. Uh, the red is one of the early versions of the, the modified current account published. Uh, that was published in July 2017. That's probably version uh, 2.0. That does go on to 2015, 16, and 17, I think, or even 16, but it, it diverges from the latest uh, modified current account. Uh, there was changes in the treatment uh, of some of the issues relating to, to aircraft and IP um, that uh, made a, a better modified current account. But you can see this upward improvement from 2010 uh, as the economy has recovered and as some of the imbalances that built up up to 2008 and 2009 uh, were reduced. And historically, the current account uh, is very important, particularly from looking for, for periods of crisis in the Irish economy. So we take the full suite uh, of data that the CSO have uh, on the current account. And that blue line is a bit more coherent uh, than otherwise should be. That's just taking one version uh, from the previous chart. But if you look at our current account going back to 1970 and say, like, when did we run into trouble? Like, you can look at the late, early 80s, you can look at the current account from 75, 76 on, you see it deteriorating up to 80, 81. We were living beyond our means. And then you can go forward to 2004, 5, 6, and you can see the same happening again up to 2008, 9, <coughs> that the, the current account can be a bit of a canary in the coal mine. It is something that drips over uh, before uh, the, the crisis periods emerge. And the full sequence of data um, gives us maybe the importance of looking at this indicator and what it might mean. <coughs> but if you look at the latest figure, we can see we're at a peak. 6.5% uh, uh, of modified GNI star uh, for 2018, or a figure in around 13 billion. Well, is the Irish economy running uh, the largest current account surpluses uh, it has ever done, given the, the sequence of, of data we have here? So this is where we begin to look at the, um, the sector accounts. <coughs> so as Peter's gone through, within the sector accounts, you have the, the different activities that the, the companies and the sectors undertake. And if you want to link the current account to the sector accounts, you can do it by looking at the outcome for savings minus investment. Uh, in the sector account, savings minus investment will give you the equivalent figure for the outturn in the, um, the, the balance of payments. So here we have sort of the, the headline figures, the original figures for the different sectors of the Irish economy. Again, taking the modified current account, deteriorating up to 2008 and then re uh, increasing for the past 10 years or so. And looking at it by sector. So for each sector, you have their gross savings uh, minus their gross fixed capital formation. Uh, and that gives you, in a sense, their contribution to uh, the current account of the balance of payments. And you can see that increasing up to that 6.5% of GNI star figure for 2018. <clears throat> now, one issue with the, the recent years of this is that if you look at the, uh, the red uh, blocks for each of the most recent years, so these are the non-financial corporations uh, with all the adjustments for the aircraft and the intangibles uh, applied to them. So you get sort of a, a non-financial corporation star. But look at for 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, it goes positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. So is this just noise? Like is that jump in 2018 up to that current account surplus of 6.5% just due to something that, because of the huge gross flows that Chris has gone through, like have we just got noise that doesn't give us uh, any great insight into something that could be relied on as being part of our um, national savings. So what the, the new sector accounts do is allow us to break the non-financial corporations and the financial corporations into domestic and foreign. So in effect, we can strip out the foreign and look at what's happening with um, the domestic sector. So we already have a plausible story for households and government. Do we have a plausible story for our financial and non-financial corporations? And if you wanted to talk about the Irish economy for the last two decades, like just putting up one chart, this chart would get you uh, a lot of the way there in terms of what households and governments and firms have been doing uh, for the last 15 or 20 years. So it's not complete. Maybe if you had the capital account, you'd be able to get the capital flows between different sectors, particularly from the government uh, to the financial sector. But looking at the current account and the sectoral contributions is quite useful. So this is what's new. <clears throat> so these types of charts have been produced before. The Department of Finance produced a, a chart on the original data there uh, in a paper they published back during the summer. Uh, and presented at the Dublin Economic Workshop. Uh, and Kevin Timoney in, in the Fiscal Council has also worked uh, on a chart and a variation of this, and it has got me a lot of the way towards what we have here. <clears throat> so if you look at what's in the new data, we actually see a very coherent 
plausible and possibly logical story that doesn't have these elements bouncing around and actually has uh, a sense of stability. And particularly if you look at the household or now domestic financial corporations and our domestic non-financial corporations, going across the top, that set of six, I'll do a quiz question and ask you what flag it is, but maybe it's Romania, we six Romanian flags <laughs> going along there. <coughs> so all running a, a surplus of savings over uh, investment uh, for each of the last six years. And then what we see in the government sector is a large deficit in 2013 and moving to a position of balance um, over the period. <coughs> so this tells us, in a sense, what's happening at a domestic sector level. And by and large, it's what we'd expect. Like We know households are deleveraging, and we see that consistent blue bar there uh, across all the years uh, where households have been reducing their liabilities. And maybe as time goes on, it might be the case that this reduces. It could be that they move to accumulating uh, financial assets. <coughs> we see the domestic financial corporations running a positive figure here. Uh, in a sense, once you get to the uh, bottom of the, the sector accounts, uh, their value added minus um, their compensation of employees, the dividends they pay out, uh, their net interest margin runs to a positive figure. So that's a, a positive contribution to the balance sheets uh, of our domestic financial corporations, maybe to cover some of the, <coughs> the revaluations, that the bad debts they might have if they're uh, reducing the value of their assets. So that wouldn't necessarily be new capital for the banks given that it's after dividends, etc., But it would be going on to their balance sheets. And then maybe the new insight for the domestic non-financial corporations. And rather than having this red bar bounce from positive to negative, we see it being consistently positive. Uh, and our domestic non-financial corporations being in a net lending position, uh, having additional financial assets to put on their balance sheet. Uh, and maybe most notably, it looks relatively stable, but it has been increasing since 2015. Uh, and maybe there is a link back to the sort of explosion in the balance sheet uh, that Chris referred to in the domestic non-financial corporations, because this would all have been hidden before. And if we saw things happening like that, I think we'd attribute it to the, the foreign companies. Well, this is distortions, again, from the foreign multinationals. But maybe our own boys are somewhat uh, at things uh, as well. So just looking at the, uh, similar to what, what Chris has put up in terms of the increase in the balance sheet of the domestic um, non-financial corporate sector uh, and you can see it going from in terms of financial liabilities um, 300 billion 2012, 2013, 2014 up to over 500 billion a 200 billion increase in quite a short period of time particularly across 2015 and 2016 uh, but the bottom line the difference between liabilities and assets is largely unchanged in or around that minus 100 billion right across <coughs> so what impact has this been happening and can we see it uh, within the sector accounts, like what sort of uh, transactions have these companies been, been entered into? And maybe one possibility to look at um, is, uh, sorry, is on the, the retained earnings uh, on foreign direct investment. So what have the companies been doing? And where does it show up in the flows? So we have increases in loans, but it's not really showing up in increases in interest. If you look at the interest figures for the domestic non-financial corporate sector staying relatively stable. But one that has been changing has been the inflows uh, of retained earnings uh, on FDI. So these are the, the foreign subsidiaries, the foreign undertakings uh, of Irish NFCs, uh, and the earnings, the, the operating surpluses they have that they're retaining, that it's staying abroad, but it's been attributed to the, the parents, to the owner, uh, which is the Irish company uh, resident here. And if you look at this flow, well, not necessarily a flow, but the, the pattern of these retained earnings, you think they can increased by around 300% in just six years, gone from less than a billion in 2013 and 2014 to heading for three and a half billion uh, in 2018. <clears throat> so maybe this is linked to the, the increase in the, the balance sheet of the domestic NFC sector. Maybe we have a, a homegrown um, distortion, uh, all of our own in terms of what the um, the companies are doing. So this would have been hidden previously if we saw uh, inflows and outflows of retained earnings on FDI. We need to attribute it to the multinationals or possibly to the redomicile PLCs. Right? We wouldn't be looking at what is happening with, with domestic companies. Uh, so it wouldn't have been something that uh, our attention would have been drawn to. But now that we have the split, uh, we can actually see that. <clears throat> so why is it happening? Why do we have this explosion in the the balance sheet of the domestic NFC sector, Irish multinationals, 
uh, and this increase in the, the retained earnings uh, on their FDI. So in general, it's not clear. We can look at some reasons why it might be happening, uh, but at least now we get to see it. Uh, if this is important, we now ha have visibility of it. So it could be just a genuinely positive story that Irish multinationals, their foreign undertakings, are performing hugely successfully and that the profits they are generating uh, are increasing at a, a pretty significant rate uh, and they're keeping those profits in whatever markets they're being earned. They're, they're reinvesting them, are, are not distributing them back to the parent in Ireland. <laughs> and that would be the, the benign, the positive story. <clears throat> but given the increase in the balance sheet, and the fact that you have liabilities and uh, assets rise at the same time, like Chris went through that companies generally undertake um, borrowing to purchase real assets to have uh, buildings, etc. But because the net financial positions remain the same, like both the financial assets and the financial liabilities are, are rising at pretty much the same rate. Like so what real assets are being purchased or invested in uh, if the net financial position uh, is staying much the same? So maybe that benign positive story um, has a bit of an undercurrent that, that it might be worth exploring. So is this having uh, a negative effect? Like, are funds that might otherwise be available for domestic investment being kept offshore? So we'll just assume for a start that, first of all, they're being kept offshore. It's possible that maybe they're being moved offshore. Uh, given the flows, it can be hard to see what's happening. And if they are being moved offshore, <laughs> are tax payments being impacted? Uh, is this essentially what could be considered Irish output being transferred abroad? Um, so being excluded from Irish GDP, but then coming back in and being included in Irish GNP, uh, but not being subject to tax. Although we have a worldwide regime, uh, it may be that there are uh, tax implications there. This is all just uh, theorising at this stage, but it is something that the new figures show up. In terms of having a negative effect, it doesn't really seem to be having a negative effect on uh, investment. If you look at the sector and you know, see the amount of investment undertaken uh, by domestic NFCs, in the period in question, that has actually doubled. So gone from 7.7 .7 billion to, to over 15 billion. Um, so it doesn't appear to be having a detrimental impact uh, on investment. If you look at tax, their tax payments have almost doubled, always do have also doubled. Uh, the new accounts give you insight into the CT payments uh, made by both. So when it comes to the, um, the new sector accounts, we have that insight uh, that previously wouldn't have been there. Uh, and I think just in passing, uh, it is probably worth mentioning corporation tax in general uh, and talking about the current account being um, a good indicator of imbalances building up in your economy. Um, one of the imbalances that might be building up currently in the Irish economy is, of course, corporation tax. And that actually boosts the current account. So in this instance, it may be that by the time the canary falls off the perch, uh, it's already dead because uh, we won't see it uh, until it actually happens. Uh, the current account could remain positive because of the large payments by the foreign multinationals. And it's only at the time of the crisis that the current account could dip. <clears throat> so the corporation tax uh, is now appearing in the current account. Usually taxes are a domestic feature of the economy, a transfer from sectors uh, to the government because of the large payments by the foreign multinationals in Ireland, which are again visible in the accounts. Uh, it may be that there's a, a distortion in the current account. Not necessarily one that you want to take out, but that 13 billion figure is being boosted uh, by the corporation tax. It has definitely been money uh, that is being uh, paid to us, uh, but whether it's been done so in a permanent fashion remains to be seen. So what can we uh, say in general about the, the new breakdown in the accounts, this foreign uh, domestic split? Well, one that it's very useful. You could go and look at it from the multinational perspective, but because of the scale and size of them, maybe we could see what was happening with the multinationals, the foreign-owned multinationals um, previously. What we now get uh, is better insight into the domestic sector. And you can go through the different stages of the accounts uh, to see, uh, see what's happening. So I've just looked at the bottom line, the net lending, how that might link to the, uh, the, the current account of the balance of payments, and how it feeds into some of the insights we see in, in the financial balance sheet. <clears throat> and as well as doing something like this for, for the current account, you can also do sectoral and also by NACE, by industry, breakdown of contributions to, to output, uh, income and growth, and maybe get a clearer picture uh, of what's happening in the Irish economy. So we have a clearer picture of the current account. It now looks like all sectors are contributing positively to our, our balance of payment surplus. But you can do something similar uh, for other uh, breakdowns, uh, within the, for other aggregates within the national accounts. <clears throat> could there be additions? Well, given some of the distortions in our capital account, maybe you could do with a, a KA star. Um, wouldn't be huge value there. There isn't a, a huge amount to be gained. 
Uh, but because of some of the distortions, rather than doing savings minus investment, if you had KA star, you could maybe just do net lending um, in totality. And maybe then in terms of the balance sheet, if we could get the net international investment position uh, that stripped out some of the, the foreign distortions, see uh, how our balance sheet position looks. Uh, so just to, to conclude, we, we do have figures on the, the net international investment position, so the, the cross-border financial assets and liabilities. Uh, and for the Irish economy, very much negative. And you can see for, for 2015, because of the acquisition of intangibles, uh, it became very much more negative. But this doesn't really give us the, the underlying picture. So, uh, one thing you can do maybe to get an underlying picture is to strip out the, the NFC sector as a whole, to strip out all non-financial corporates. Uh, because by and large, you might have assumed it was down to the, the activities of multinationals. Uh, and for the last six or seven years, it kind of shows that the Irish economy has been benefiting from the saving we've been doing and from rises in assets. And our net international investment position uh, has been going in the right direction. But maybe the level is a bit out here. By stripping out the, the NFCs, um, you might be stripping out some of the, the, the domestic uh, activities of, of Irish companies as well. Now, as Chris has said, by and large, you do tend to borrow domestically. So if they have borrowings, and that's from the financial sector, well, at least you're including that. So some issues here would be what is included in the IFSC. It's a bit of a sort of a, an old definition at this stage, and maybe um, changes could be made to, to what's included or excluded there. And then maybe excluding all NFCs isn't appropriate. Now, one thing to note is the levels might be a bit out, but given that, if we go back a good bit, when we looked at the, the balance sheet of the NFC, the domestic NFC sector itself, their bottom line stayed much the same. It was negative 100 billion. So unless they're significantly changing the composition uh, of their borrowing and their assets uh, on a cross-border basis, uh, this last chart here, the blue line, in trend terms, might roughly be okay that our net international investment position is improving. We may be getting that insight, adding the, the, the impact of, of the Irish NSCs might give a, a better position of the level like, are we really plus 100 billion? Uh, but I think the trend is by and large okay. So in overall terms, I think the, the new data has been very useful. Uh, it allows us better insights into some of those. And, and my take was in terms of the current account. And it does look like the, the 2018 figure, even though when it came out last year, there was some people questioning it. It does look somewhat plausible. Thanks very much.